I trouble myself with big questions. What does it mean to be human is near top of my list. I think to approach this perennial question by trying to discern unique human traits and trying to determine how they came about. Two such unique human traits are art and religion, and I've had an uneven personal history with them. Exploring religion, the search for the transcendent has been a lifelong pursuit. Examining art, diverse expressions of creativity is a recent endeavor. What's the developmental history of art and religion? Can the anthropological record provide insight? In particular, can the anthropological record connect art and religion? Did art and religion co-evolve? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. I see coordinated, contemporaneous histories of art and religion. That's why I'm paying attention to a long-term project of the Templeton Religion Trust with art and religion as primary themes. It's called Art Seeking Understanding, and one facet of the project applies principles of the more advanced cognitive science of religion to the more developing cognitive science of art. I'm attending the project's two initial meetings in Nassau, Bahamas and Grand Rapids, Michigan. I begin in Nassau with a leader in the cognitive science of religion, experimental psychologist Justin Barrett. Justin, what does the evolution of art tell us about the essence of art, and particularly from your experience dealing with the evolution of religion and the cognitive science of religion. It seems to me that at least a productive approach to this comparison is to think in terms of what are the cognitive foundations of artistic expression, production, and how do they compare to that in religion? Is there an overlapping space of those sorts of cognitive foundations? And then could they have mutually encouraged each other in the course of evolution? So we might think that uh, one of the things that uh, lies behind artistic expression is something like the ability to understand that something I produce or sing, recite, evokes in your mind a particular reaction. And I can predict that pretty well. And you know that I'm trying to do that to you. Well, that's actually pretty sophisticated theory of mind, we call it. I have an understanding that your thoughts about this other object are somewhat determined by my thoughts in how I produce that. And we're having that mutual engagement around that work. Well, that's art, but we see that in religion too. For you and I to know that we're worshiping the same God, we have to have some kind of way to track each other's thoughts in relation to that God. So that I, you know that when I'm doing a particular ritual, for instance, I'm doing that to change maybe the attitude of that God toward me. And, but I know that you see me doing that, so you know I'm, we're on the same team here. So in that case, we might think that both religion and art is subserved by this ability to jointly attend, to have what's called higher order theory of mind. That's one example. Um, we might think that curiosity is a common denominator as well for these two areas. In fact, it's been suggested that that, that drive to think about What's our ultimate purpose? Uh, what's broader meaning? Uh, how can I see the world differently or th imagine alternative possibilities about the future underlies both religious expression and artistic expression. So by this kind of a cognitive approach, thinking what are the cognitive foundations of the two areas, we can start identifying what are those background conditions that had to have evolved and under what conditions might those have evolved in our ancestors? It's almost certainly the case that in prehistory, art and religion weren't separate categories, but they were just different forms of human expression, thought, and so forth, maybe with slightly different features, but there wouldn't have been this category art and this category religion. They just would have been things we do, yeah, yeah. things we do together, ways we try to think about the world and imagine future possibilities. In the earliest expressions of, of art, what, I mean, what were they? Well, you know, some of the earliest art might be completely lost to us because it didn't leave a material trace. If, if singing, for instance, was the oldest art, we wouldn't know. 
or dance or even dramatic interpretation or poetry, epics. We don't know how far back these go. But when it comes to visual art, at least, some of the earliest evidence that we have so far is about 90,000 years ago. What it seems is that as long as there have been humans, it's a safe bet we were engaged in the arts. Mm. How about uh, early evidence of religious themes? Some of the earliest evidence that we think of as religious expression, that we have material remains for, that's the key, right? It's usually burials. Burials are among the oldest. Those at least seem to be the kind of thing we would call religious uh, because they're seems to suggest people had some kind of view of the afterlife, at least that's a common interpretation. These may be going back 50, 60, 70, 80,000 years. So they're fairly coterminous with each other. And that's interesting, right? Because if they have all of these cognitive features in common, it wouldn't be a surprise then that we see material traces of their expression in common as well. The strategy in the cognitive science of religion is to look for what are the constituent parts, the the cognitive mechanisms that humans seem to have to have that make religion really natural, make it easy to acquire, uh, to transmit, to spread. We could look for the same types of things in art. One key element that the two might have in common is the role of agency. In the religious world, it's really easy to think of that. Agents are these intentional beings that make things go. Gods, ghosts, spirits. You might say, well, how does that work in the arts? Well, it seems that a really important feature of the arts, I'm speculating, is realizing there's a mind behind this expression, that there's an agent making it happen. And in fact, in the anthropological record, the idea that someone brought about this beauty seems to be critical. If it's really beautiful, we make these attributions to that agency of having special properties, maybe even divine properties. Right? I mean, the gods are speaking through a particular person when they create something of amazing beauty. So there may be some commonalities there and some themes that they share in common and also some research strategies. I'm not aware. From Justin's work on the cognitive science of religion, he offers two factors to uncover deep connections between art and religion. Similar timelines of their anthropological histories and similar cognitive elements, including theory of mind, appreciating how other people think, higher order theory of mind, shared experiences, curiosity, a drive for broader meaning, agency, intentional beings making stuff happen. Intriguing parallels, but I need to be mindful of just so stories, imposing correspondences, or imagining patterns between art and religion that sound credible but cannot be proved. Crucial here could be their evolutionary histories. I speak with an anthropologist who studies cognition underlying culture, including the evolution of religion, Pascal Boyer. If you look at art from an evolutionary point of view, one thing you tend to see is that there is no such thing as an essence of art. There's lots of artistic productions. There's certainly aesthetic experience in lots of human societies. But there are lots of things that we think of as art that we don't find in many places. One of them is the idea of art as separate from other domains of experience. Another one is the notion of an object, the objet d'art as something very special and intrinsically different from other uh, productions. A third one is art being separate from pragmatic concerns, uh, useful things. Uh, in most societies in the world, art is useful and the difference between art and craftsmanship is very difficult to, to draw. However, there is aesthetic experience and there is also, to some extent, a connection between aesthetic experience and spiritual religious concerns. So uh, how are you distinguishing, first of all, between aesthetic experience and art? So I would say that aesthetic experience is much easier to define because it has to do with reward and satisfaction and approach. You know, there are objects that you want to approach rather than avoid. There's um, pleasure that can be expressed at uh, the enjoyment of particular objects or natural scenes, of course. Whereas art is a cultural category, something that happened in some society where we decide that certain kinds of objects, because they trigger those experiences, should be 
set apart from ordinary life. And can you identify uh, in evolutionary history wh when that, in what societies that has occurred? Or? I think it's not an evolutionary history. These things happen in large-scale literate civilizations. There is such a thing in East, Eastern civilizations in China or Japan. There is such a thing in Western art from medieval times or maybe humanist and Renaissance times. There is such a thing in Islamic civilizations. And however, if you go to small-scale societies, the ones we lived in for most of our evolutionary history and prehistory, there is no such thing as art as separate from pragmatic concerns, from useful objects or things like that. Was there a time when, when that uh, differentiation occurred? When... I would say that in antiquity, we find evidence for some kind of, in you know, Greek-Roman uh, times for a separation of art from uh, aesthetic and artistic concerns from uh, pragmatic concerns that we don't find in earlier civilizations, probably in Egypt or Mesoamerican civilizations, where what we think is, for example, sacred productions, you know, temples, sculptures, etc., considered purely useful objects whose shape has to be there because it has a connection to worship, to gods. What about the co development uh, evolutionary between art and religion? So that's another. Uh, big problem because we have two sorts of things in, in, that we call religion in anthropology and they're very different. Uh, one is what we're all familiar with. A religion has a set of beliefs. There's a doctrine which organizes those beliefs. There are specialists that are part of an organization, a church, a tradition. There is such a thing as faith and belonging to a community of believers. All these things seem to us to be what religion is. All these things are very recent. They appeared in large-scale societies, in a few traditions in the world, and then they conquered the world. For most of human history, religion was a pragmatic concern. It was something that was done by specialists, like shamans or healers, that was supposed to palliate or prevent misfortune, mostly. They didn't have a doctrine. It's very surprising to many people here, but it's very common to anthropologists that if you ask people, what are the spirits like? People say, I have no idea. And more important, it doesn't matter what they're like. What matters is how they can affect us and who can prevent that. Mm -hmm. the, their characteristics are not a matter of speculation. Pascal offers a deflationary, more minimalist view of art and religion. He distinguishes the aesthetic experience, which deals with pragmatic concerns of reward and satisfaction and is common in the anthropological record, from art, which isolates objects from ordinary life and occurs only in large-scale literate societies. As for religion, it too separated late from pragmatic concerns. Throughout most of human history, he says, Religion was the purview of specialists like shamans and had no specific doctrines or named spirits. What we consider religion today is also the product of large-scale literate societies. Thus, the apparent coherence between art and religion suggests their cognitive similarities. Cognitive similarities, is that the fundamental link? Lucky I'm still at the workshop in Nassau because so is Justin Barrett. I'll find him and ask him. We've made a lot of progress in what's called the cognitive science of religion in applying cognitive insights to account for why it is certain forms of religious expression seem to be cross-culturally recurrent, easily acquired, hard to shake under different kinds of social environments. And maybe similar strategies can be used then for exploring different art forms. What is it about music, dance, uh, painting, drawing, that makes them so easily acquired in childhood, for instance? What are the intuitive hooks that make us motivated to do these kinds of things? What is it about the human mind that makes different forms of visual expression or movement expression, musical expression, just spread so well in groups. So I think there's a lot of sharing that can happen there, just methodologically, um, theoretically. But it's also the case that this category art and this category religion, these are impositions on the material, right? Surely 100,000 years ago, there weren't these concepts. 
But there were people doing things like um, scratching representations in ochre, maybe dancing already, maybe dances that were emotional expressions at a beautiful sunrise or an approaching thunderstorm that communicated certain types of ideas that just couldn't be communicated in other ways, this sort of great awe or great fear. And they were the same kinds of ideas that were also being talked, at, talked about around the campfire that maybe was proto-theology. Or is it the case that both are related to a, a way of thinking in the human mind and that the, the concepts of art and religion and the interdigitation between them is a historical anachronism that we're imposing on That's that, right. but both of them are related to some activity of the mind. The real phenomenon is related to something that's in our subconscious. I think that's a, it's a real possibility that uh, what we're thinking of as the arts and what we're thinking of as religion really are drawing on some of the same wellsprings um, in terms of our cognition. Some people would say that uh, reduces art and religion to just physical processes in our brain and sort of undermines both of them. Look, if I want to know how a car works, it's really helpful for me to know how the parts work. And then by knowing how the parts work, we can put together other cars, right? <laughs> so the whole is important if it turns out it's a meaningful whole. But understanding how the parts work helps us build a better car, helps us to appreciate how to care for the car that we've got. To Justin, because we explain how something works does not mean we explain away what something means that cognitive processes account for aesthetic experiences and religious belief does not mean that they are any less true. Assuming that art and religion have, in some sense, co-developed, co-evolved, how did it happen? What was the process? To simplify, I focus on the anthropology of art. But are the theories testable? I asked the director of the Cambridge Body, Mind, and Behavior Laboratory, experimental psychologist, Simone Schnall. Why humanity throughout history have spent enormous amounts of time, resources, and efforts in creating art on one hand, but then also appreciating art. Mm -hmm. One then has to consider, well, is there some obvious benefit to it? Perhaps not so much to the individual, but to the community in which the art is, is uh, produced. One interesting way of looking at it is in a similar way as we would look to um, any sort of prosocial behavior or altruistic behavior, where the question also is, why would, why would people do something costly to them? And I suppose one explanation has been, well, one has to look at the larger context of the group, of who benefits overall, even if you have or I have a bit of a sacrifice, perhaps our community benefits in some way. And perhaps one can make a similar argument with aesthetics or art, where there's some benefit, some adaptive advantage of that whole process. Is that an absolute requirement to be an adaptive process? And um, this is the evolutionary yes. uh, mantra. First of all, it's always hard to, quote unquote, prove any sort of evolutionary sure. argument. But at the same time... But that seems an intellectual foundationally a, assumption. And that's I'm, right. I'm not sure. Yes. I mean, there are crazy people who do things that are not in any interest. Yes. And sometimes they well, create great if, art. Yes. But if we think on average or across time, so again, 40,000 years ago, that's when all this right, right, at least right. started. And it creation of art has continued throughout a long time across many cultures, pretty much all cultures that we're aware of. So it stands to reason that there is something behind it, like very likely, that is useful. Whether it's still useful or adaptive in the same sense today. You know, that, that's what I'm challenging sure. in a way. Because... That's where empirical testing comes in, right? Yeah. That's where we take the approach of cognitive science, experimental psychology. Yeah. Let's hypothesize that there is a social aspect to art. And we can put people in experimental situations, let's say a group context where mm -hmm. somebody is the designated artist, compare that to the same uh, situation where it's the person by themselves without any social context. So, so in a very simplified way, trying to get at, well, what is the social element in art production? If, is there one? But in principle, at least, these are testable questions. 
Assuming that art in its developmental history had some useful adaptive social value, it would seem even more likely that religion did as well. If there are indeed testable questions today, could we somehow test the coevolution of art and religion in the past? I go to Grand Rapids, Michigan to meet someone who might think so. An expert on cognition and culture, Thomas Lawson. Is there a way of studying the past in the same way that we study the present? And most people say no, because if it involves people, then people are already dead and you can't interview them. And uh, there are historians that have said, we, oh, cognitive science is interesting, but you know, it doesn't apply to us at all. And my attitude, my guess is that a good way to deal with this is to understand what retrodiction is. Retrodiction is the op opposite of prediction. <laughs> Can we retrodict the past? Can we predict what we would find in the past if such and such were the case? Now, from a retrodictive point of view, what you really do is speculate on the basis of the knowledge you have of what you could find if the data were there. So if the data is ever found, it then matches your prediction, mm -hmm. in this case, retrodiction. So take retrodiction as yes. a methodology and apply it to the co-evolution of art and religion. One of the things that interests me is the role of ritual. Now, from a retrodictive point of view, I would predict that in, in those cave paintings, that they would not simply be like graffiti. I would predict that some of these would be so difficult to reach that you would have to go through special kinds of procedures in order to find them. And why? Because I would argue that that would have been part of the ritual, mm. that only certain people who had been gone through all the other stages, and by the way, this is what we're finding out mm. right now, mm that there's, there's one cave in South Africa that they've discovered recently that is so difficult that they had to uh, advertise for very, very short people <laughs> so they could climb over this last narrow little tunnel to get to right. find the, the real stuff right. over there. So that meant that, that there were certain kinds of formal activities that these people had to go through. And the retrodiction is that if they are rituals as opposed to just beauty or opposed to just uh, you go. counting the animals that they killed uh, for food or something very economical, right. if there was a religious ritual, it would be more difficult. There would be uh, challenges added to it. That's right. Uh, more difficult uh, and, uh, and the the cave would actually demonstrate why it was difficult, mm. to, you know? The challenge to that is that a retrodiction, by definition, can only be affirmed, it cannot be negated. Because if you make a retrodiction and there's no data, uh, that doesn't disconfirm it because it, no, the no, data it, may be yeah. found in next year, next week, or, or in a million years. I would say, however, that the importance of uh, about retrodiction is its ability to tell you what you ought to be looking for. Oh. Now, of course, if you don't find it, you don't find it. You know, tough luck. <laughs> but if you do find it, it's very exciting. In describing what it means to be human, art and religion stand out. The developmental story of each art and religion via archaeology, anthropology, history provides unavoidable commentary on humanity. Taken together, the possible co-evolution of art and religion takes on significance. How to approach the co-evolution hypothesis? Consider four ways. Develop a cognitive science of art like a cognitive science of religion. Recognize that art and religion seem synchronous in their developmental paths. Analyze adaptive features of art and religion by assessing social elements of each. Retrodict past connections between art and religion by asking what could follow from new data. What traits or intuitive hooks 
could underlie the co-evolution of art and religion. Theory of mind, curiosity, agency, inspiration, imagination, awareness of death. But is there danger for both art and religion of reading into our evolutionary past too much of our contemporary categories and sensibilities? To me, art and religion link not only by cognitive capacities and anthropological timelines, but also by their unified pragmatic origins as one kind of thing, and by their transcendent visions as ultimate goals. That's closer to truth. For complete interviews, and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.